Good morning. <laughs> May every one of his devoted followers hear our passionate praise to him, even among the council of the holy ones. For God's mighty miracles astound me. God's wonders are so delightfully mysterious that they leave all who seek them astonished. Everything God does is full of splendor and beauty. Each miracle demonstrates eternal perfection. God's unforgettable works of surpassing wonder reveal grace and tender mercy. God satisfies all who love and trust him, and he keeps every promise he makes. God reveals mighty power and marvels to his people by handing them nations as a gift. All God accomplishes is flawless, faithful, and fair, and his every word proves trustworthy and true. They are steadfast forever and ever, formed from truth and righteousness. His forever love paid the full ransom for his people. So that now we're free to come before the Lord to worship his holy name. Where can wisdom be found? It is born in the fear of God. Everyone who follows his ways will never lack understanding. And the adoration of God will continue throughout eternity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving God, maker of this day, we thank you for the ways that you have gathered and drawn us to this place this morning. We come before you during this time to bring you praise for what you have done and for who you are. We are so grateful for the ways that you sustain us and nurture us, for the gift of your spirit and the gift of one another. Would you reveal yourself to each of us in new ways this morning? Help us to learn more about loving you and loving others, and to leave this place looking a little bit more like you than when we arrived. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. I'm going to ask Pastor Daniel to come light our Christ candle. As we do every week, we begin our service by lighting this candle at the center of our focus. As a visible reminder to all of us gathered here of the presence of the God who has been at work in our lives, drawing us here, who will be at work in us during this time together, and who will continue to be at work in us as we do. Church, would you please stand? May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us turn and pass that piece to one another. <laughs>
reading comes from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. And the word of the Lord reads, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a beauty instead of a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting for the Lord for the display of his splendor. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
As we come now to our time of prayer, I invite you to take whatever posture of prayer is most appropriate this morning. As always, the altar to my right, to your left, is open if anyone wants to come and to kneel at the feet of God. And at the altar to my left, to your right, Pastor Colleen stands ready to anoint you if you or someone you know is in need of a special touch from God this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, holy God, there is none like you. We stand here amazed in the presence of the God who is holy, mighty, and to whom our response is to sing hallelujah. For you are the one who saves. Lord, we stand here before you in awe of you and in thanksgiving for you are our God who though holy does not stand far off, but whose holiness draws you to us. You are a God who loves and cares for us and whose holiness is on display in your love. So Lord, we give you thanks, for you are the holy God who draws near to us and who invites us to draw near in return. We give you thanks, for you are the God who hears us when we call on you. So, Lord, we come before you with many burdens, with many requests, many who are sick and ill, and who are in need of healing, and we lift them up to you. Lord, we think especially of Arya, who has swollen tonsils, and we ask that you would be with her and bring her healing. We think of Drew with the kidney stone, and we ask that you would continue to be at work bringing her healing, be with the doctors as they treat her. We think of Jeff, who had a heart attack recently, and we ask that you would bring healing and recovery to him as well. We think also of the many who are grieving. Think especially of Lou and Wanda in these days, and we ask that you would be near to them and to their family, and that you would touch them and bring them comfort and healing in the midst of their sorrow. Lord, we think also of the many who are suffering from violence and injustice in our community and in the wider world. Lord, we pray especially for the many conflicts in our world, and ask that you would be a God of peace. We think of all of these conflicts, Lord, and sometimes it feels like they are too big, that they are too long-lasting, and the enmity and the hatred has run deep. But we know that you are a God of peace, and justice and mercy, that you are a God of restoration and healing. And so we entrust to you those problems that are too large for us, and ask, Lord, that you would bring peace and justice on the earth. Lord, shape us to be a people who do what we can to follow in your steps. Shape us to be a people who do not treat holiness as a means of separating ourselves from another, but whose holiness is found in love, whose love drives us to our neighbor. Lord, teach us to be a people who love as you have loved us. And so, Lord, we pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One Sunday morning, Johnny's mom gave him two nickels. And he, she said, Johnny, one of these nickels is yours to buy ice cream with, and the other you put in the offering because that's God's nickel. So she said, now you be careful with both nickels. One is God's, one is yours to buy ice cream. So he skipped his way on to Sunday school and he wasn't paying much attention and all of a sudden he dropped one of his nickels in a storm drain. And he looked down at that nickel and he looked at his remaining nickel and he thought for a minute and he said, God, I'm sorry, that was your nickel that I dropped. <laughs> so I hope you have two nickels today and you can buy ice cream with one of them to give one of them to the church. I, I thank you for tolerating my stories and, and I'm thankful to you because you are a giving church in so, so many ways. And you have made it possible for this little church to do some amazing things. Ushers, you're patiently waiting. Please come forward. Take one quick note, please. I forgot to mention this too, Tim, so I apologize. Um, Tim's Today we are also taking up our offering for Nazarene Theological Seminary. Uh, so if you would like to give something toward that to support our denominational seminary as well as our local students, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. I, I um, got heard a lot of new jokes when I was in seminary. So <laughs> I came for the education and stayed for the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you. And we thank you that institutions like Nazarene Theological Seminary are equipping men and women to go out and do your work, spread your love. And we especially thank you for Nazarene Theological Seminary today. We pray that you would bless this offering, bless the, both the gift and the giver. Amen. Amen. good to be in the house of the Lord this morning on this day that the Lord has created and on this day in which we give him all praise and glory and honor. We have several ways for you to be involved in uh, the, the activities and service opportunities of St. Paul's in the coming weeks. Uh, we have an opportunity as a church family to serve a meal and to fellowship with youth and families from Heartland, one, Heartland 180 this Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, if you are interested in helping to come serve, we would love to have you. I would invite you to contact Jeannie Hayes, um, but we are excited about this opportunity to serve. Our teens and our young adults are having a Super Bowl party on Super Bowl Sunday, February 11th, beginning at 5 p.m. at the Mitchell's home. 
We are asking that as you are able, please bring um, an appetizer and a dessert that we will share together. Um, if our other adults would like to plan something, please feel free. If we want to do something, let me know and we can figure out a way to have that happen as well. Probably a lot of it's going to depend on the results of today's game, whether we want to host a party or not. <laughs> we will. Uh, we are so excited in just a couple of weeks to begin the Lenten season. We're going to begin it as we typically do with a special Ash Wednesday service here at the church on Wednesday, February 14th at 7 p.m. This is actually my second Valentine's Day as a pastor to have Ash Wednesday fall on it. And it is a... Uh, it's a certain, it's very appropriate and both bizarre at the same time, um, but it will be a very special time. We would love to have you here on Wednesday, February 14th at 7 p.m. as we begin the Lenten season with a special time of worship and reflection together. And then finally, the Kansas City District, NDI, is hosting the annual Equip KC Training Day at College Church on Saturday, February 17th from 8.30 to 12 p.m. Um, this will be a discipleship training day, and there will be a plenary session that all of us will attend together, and then there will be breakout sessions in which you can choose what you are interested in. Um, the breakout sessions will have a focus on children, teens, and adult discipleship. So if you are interested in attending, I'm going to be registering people in the next couple of weeks, so please let me know if you're interested. We would love to take a great group from St. Paul's. Well, I'm not exactly sure how to take that comment about Ash Wednesday and Valentine's Day <laughs> and it appropriately falling on the same day. I think we're doing okay uh, in our marriage. <laughs> uh, I might need to check up on that. Uh, I'll let you tell that story. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you in worship. Our text for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 21 through 28. Mark 1, verses 21 through 28. And God's word reads, They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean clean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks you. Be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that in these moments of hearing your word, of opening your word together, that they would be more than words on a page, but words taken up by your spirit and breathed into us, that they might be new life for us. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Gardner C. Taylor, who was a a well-known uh, preacher in the last century, many considered him to be one of the finest preachers in the English language, shared a story about FDR's, uh, Frederick uh, Roosevelt's administration during the midst of the, the Great Depression. Uh, he had developed a program that would send out people into, especially the agricultural areas, uh, to teach and to help equip people, uh, farmers especially, in that time, uh, how to make the most of the land that they were using so that they could increase their crops and, and make a, a healthier crop yield. And so there was a, an agent that was going all through the South and, and uh, teaching people how to make better use of their land, how to, uh, to, to create a, a situation where the crops would grow and flourish. 
He, he got to Louisiana, and as he was going and inviting people to come to the meeting that night so that he could, again, do this educational piece uh, for the community, he ran across a farmer who asked him what he was doing. And so the agent was very excited and was explaining what kind of thing he would be doing and said, you really need to come so that we can teach you how to make better use of your land. And the farmer said, oh, no, 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 I, I don't think I'll be there tonight. And the agent was perplexed. Well, why wouldn't you come? And the farmer said, well, I already do, but don't do a lot of things that I know to do. So I don't think I'll be coming tonight. I already don't do all the things I know I should be doing, so I don't think I'll be coming tonight. That, in some ways, could describe the church. I already don't do all the things I know I should be doing. Uh, William Cavanaugh, who was a Roman Catholic theologian, once talked about Jesus being in exile from the church, which is an odd kind of statement. We often think, we associate, that the church is exactly where Jesus is. But, perhaps we might be able to also name, there's been a lot of times, a lot of places, a lot of situations that we could name, where it seems like the church is the last place Jesus might be found. I've known a lot of people who would claim entire sanctification, and sometimes they were the meanest people in a board meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is about religious holy folk, but sometimes they could be the last person that I would imagine has had some sort of recent encounter with Jesus. Whether we're talking about pastors, whether we're talking about parishioners in the pew, uh, there's been a lot of people who have even walked into the doors of a church and turned right around because of the way that they encountered people and thought, well, if this is what Jesus looks like, I don't want any part of that. Anybody want to raise a hand and testify to something like that? They've experienced, they've seen, they've heard some kind of story like that, where the church seems to be the very last place that embodies the way of Jesus. And I'm not saying every church. I'm not saying every parishioner. But there's times where there is a particular kind of spirit at work, whether we're talking about the individual or the community itself, that seems to be absolutely counter to the way of Jesus. Perhaps we've experienced that. Perhaps we have embodied that at some point. Whatever the case may be, this particular text is a text that might help us think about what that looks like. For instance, when Jesus begins his ministry, he goes out into the wilderness and is baptized. He runs off into the wilderness, blown out by the Spirit, and he encounters this tense time of trial. It even says that Satan comes to tempt him. And after 40 days, he emerges from the wilderness seemingly unscathed by the time of trial and temptation, his time in the wilderness. He comes out seemingly like, I don't know, a little worse for the wear. And, and immediately he begins to go along the seashore and he finds people and he starts calling them to follow him. We, we heard that story uh, recently. They do what? Immediately drop their nets and follow him. Immediately. It doesn't seem like there's much resistance up until the point Jesus goes to church. <laughs> and that's where he first encounters significant resistance. He, he sits down in the synagogue, and, and imagine synagogue is like a local church in the community where they would read scripture, they would tell the stories of God's redemptive work throughout the life of Israel, they would sing songs together, they, they would hear instruction about how they were to apply the scriptures to their life and live out this way of God in the midst of their world. It was a, a time where the religious community, the faith community, would gather together to be reminded of who they are and how they are to live their lives in response, in grateful response to all that God has done through the life of Israel and what God will continue to do in the life of Israel. Here they are, gathered as the faithful, and Jesus is speaking a word from the scriptures and, and obviously teaching with great authority. People are impressed. They're taken aback. They, they say, man, he teaches as one who teaches 
with one like with authority, but not like the scribes. The scribes were those people who were supposed to be sort of the, the lawyers of the day, the people who really knew the scriptures well and could in, you know uh, dig in with great insight and and help the community understand what's being said and done in the scriptures so that they could again apply it to their lives and live it out. But it says that they they don't hold a candle to what Jesus is doing. It, Jesus seems to teach as one with authority. And in the midst of teaching with authority, coming bursting on the scene is a man who seems to have this unclean spirit about him. And he starts raving in the middle of a worship service, yelling at Jesus, what do you want with us? Are you here to destroy us? What a question. Uh, that is a seemingly strange question to ask Jesus in the middle of a worship service. What do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? This is a, a one man, a person, who is talking in the plural. Mm -hmm. That's very strange. Now, I know that happens from occasion to occasion where a, one person will talk about uh, themselves in the plural, but but it's strange that in a worship service, this individual comes talking about the plural us. Who is he referring to? Is he referring to himself and the spirit? That is a possibility. Maybe he's referring to himself and the rest of the congregation. Maybe he's referring to himself and the rest of the congregation. What do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? There's an interesting kind of tactic that we sometimes take when we are listening to the words of Scripture that, that we will sort of manipulate them so we can traverse between the Scriptures without being uh, marked by it too much, that our lives aren't put under the microscope. And we do things like, man, I wish my neighbor could hear this. They really need to hear this. <laughs> by which I mean... I've got this figured out. I don't need to hear this. What, what do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? Uh, we, we, we find ways of getting around the scripture so that the, the implications of scripture or what God is calling us to do, we might just sort of circumnavigate around it. I mean, we are here after all. We are faithful. We came singing the songs of praise and reading the scripture. Surely that means that we are doing the very things that we need to do. What do you have to do with us? Are you, are you here to destroy us? I mean, I have seen all sorts of gymnastics done in recent years around the, the realities of politics where people who claim to follow the way of Jesus and yet say things drastically different than Jesus and yet we are following right behind them like a bunch of lemmings. What do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? When Jesus' words and own teaching, we begin to question because it doesn't line up with the trajectory that we are following, the way that we are moving. And we begin to question Jesus rather than questioning the world around us. Get the difference? When we question the motivations of Jesus and we do not question the motivations of those that we are following, we may have been somewhat captivated by an unclean spirit. We say all the right religious words, but when it comes to encountering the Christ in our midst, we do everything we can to hold Jesus at arm's distance. What do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? Imagine that the one who has died has been crucified and risen for us and for our sake. That we might see the words of Jesus as something of a threat to our way of life. It seems like an odd thing for us to say, and yet we do it all the time. Jesus, did you really mean give up all of our riches? I don't know, Jesus, that seems like too much. Maybe I can just give a little bit. Jesus, did you really mean the entirety of my life? I, 
I don't know. That seems like a lot. I mean, after all, I've, I've got to find ways of navigating life. This part of my life is my own. I'll hold on to it. Thank you very much. What do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? The realities are that it is often religious faith communities that are so deeply entrenched and in opposition to the way of Jesus that when Jesus shows up, we think Jesus is the enemy and we treat him as such. Now, I will say, none of us escape this. This isn't me pointing the finger. This is me saying, I do this too. The implications of Jesus are too difficult for me to follow through on. There, there's too many things that Jesus really calls me to give up. And if I'm being honest, I'm kind of a selfish person. It's easy for me to want to hold on to things. And to see that this, this thing that Jesus calls me to do might threaten. The very things that I seem to love so much. In such a way that it becomes a stronghold on our lives. It, it becomes something that we cannot seemingly get out from under. It, it creates this sort of bondage around us. And we find that we cannot escape it. What do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? I mean... Think about the way that the Roman Empire treats Jesus. So you are a king. In other words, so you are here to threaten us, to destroy us. Think about how the religious leaders of Jesus today respond to Jesus. They try to trap him. Let's ask him a trick question. Let's see if he really can navigate out of our trap. And then as soon as we get him trapped, we can get rid of Jesus. We do this all the time. This isn't a problem way back there. This is the human condition where we are constantly asking questions of God in order to trick God or to trap God and be able to say, Aha, I knew it. I knew all along. You weren't for us. You were against us. All along, I knew it. Like Adam and Eve, we hide in the garden of our own destruction, fearful, afraid. That to encounter God means that we ourselves will be destroyed. We are constantly hiding ourselves so that what is hidden may not come to light. That what we can hold on and keep to ourselves, we may not have to really let go. This spirit that shows up in the synagogue, in the place of worship, Jesus encounters and tells that spirit, leave, be gone. Be silent. Jesus silences the spirit who names Jesus correctly. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You, this is religious language. The spirit uses religious language just as easily as any faithful person. I know who you are. This is a strange thing. Just because we know who Jesus is, is vastly different than saying, you are my Lord. We can say all these things about who God is and who Jesus is, but it is a vastly different thing to then move to the place to say, I know who you are, and I give you everything. I, I give you everything. I, I am an open book before you, God. I give you everything, every part of my life. There is nothing that I will allow to be a, a hold on my life that I won't give to you. There is a vast difference between using religious language, as good and as important as it may be, to move to the place of saying, will you free me? Will you give me life? Will you be my Lord? Jesus comes to the place of worship as the very first place that he begins his ministry of reconciliation. Of casting out that which has become so broken. Imagine that. Jesus shows up in a worship space anticipating that this may be the very first place that needs to experience the freedom of God. 
And in some sense, that's okay. We come, all of us, bearing those things in us that need to be free. That need to have the redemptive, redeeming love of Christ touching us in that place so that we might experience the freedom of God in the totality of God's life. We all come to those places. We all come to the worship services needing that freedom, that touch. We're not that different from this man who shows up screaming in the middle of the worship service. As much as we might like to think we are. We like to think that we have this sort of persona, that we can put everything together, that we have it all together, and we like to project that to other people. Things are good, right? I mean, we do this all the time in this particular society that we live in. How are you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> Whether or not we have like a fractured leg, we're hobbling out of a hospital, we've just been in a car wreck, Life is falling apart. We could be all sorts of battered and bruised, both externally and internally. And what are we going to say? Oh, we're good. Things are fine. But what if? What if in coming to worship, we might say this? Things aren't fine. Things are hard. They're broken. And I'm struggling to get free. It's amazing that the one who comes to bring freedom is willing and is able to give freedom from those things that hold us and bind us. Amen. All of us, regardless. What do you have to do with us? Are you here to destroy us? And the answer is no. 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 Jesus heals this man who seems to be so antagonistic and contrary and working against Jesus in this moment. Jesus meets this person at the place of their own brokenness and touches them and heals them. There is nothing that you have done. There is no place that you have gone that God is not aware of and that God cannot begin to do the healing work that is necessary for each of us. Amen. Jesus meets us in this place of worship, not to destroy us, not to bring us down, not to shame us, but to bring freedom. Amen. Yes. And at this table, at this table, Jesus invites us. Jesus invites us to this table that we might experience the totality of the freedom of God in our own lives. Is there something that has bound you today? Is there something that is holding you that you struggle with and you do not know how to move past it? And the question you keep asking is, God, why won't you do something? What do you have to do with me? Jesus wants to say everything. This table, Jesus gives God's very life for us and for our sake, Amen. withholding nothing. All of God's grace is available at this table for us to encounter God here and now at the place of our brokenness, at the place where we most desperately need to be healed. So I'm going to invite us to come with all of the brokenness, with all of the questions, all of the hurt, with all the things that bind us, to come to this table knowing that God can heal and bring wholeness. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us, not when we had it all together, but while we were yet sinners.
proving God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we, we are a forgiven people. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you. And he broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take it, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is uh, for, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, suffering and offering. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Church, as we come this morning, I invite you to come down the center aisle and to return to the side. We will receive the elements and we'll hold them and take them together. But as always, we come with empty hands, recognizing that what we bring isn't getting us this meal. It's not anything that we have earned to receive grace. Grace simply means gift. This is God's gift to us. Regardless, regardless of what has held us, God desires to bring freedom today. Come and receive that which God gives so free. I invite you to peel back the first layer. What have you to do with us? Everything. Jesus has put on our flesh, dwelt among us, so that we might also experience the life of God. Take, eat, and be thankful. I invite you to go back to the second layer to reveal the juice. What have you to do with us? Everything. God pours God's own life out in totality, withholding nothing from us, so that we might experience the fullness of God's life here and now, even now, even as we wait for the fulfilling of God's promises. Take, drink, and be thankful. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. 
Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise God from whom all 